session of the year. Um, for those who don't know me, my name is Matthew Rose, um, industry engagement based here in Transport and Main Roads. Our area essentially are the custodians of all the whole of government ICT procurement panels. Um, so first of all, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the various lands and seas on which we meet today and pay my respects to elders both past, present and emerging. This is a 30 minute section um, with a 15 to 20 minute presentation by our chosen supplier um, and then followed by a Q&A. You can put questions in the chat during the presentation, but um, there's five minutes to 10 minutes at the end to ask questions directly. Um, we do record the session. Um, essentially, please turn off your cameras and your mics if you're not talking. Um, so we'll hand over to Working Maris in a second, but as a, a way of introduction, they were established in 2012. Um, it's a Brisbane-based SME, which has become renowned for modernising and optimising government and enterprise systems, combining local talent with proprietary processes and tools to deliver quality software solutions. So I'd like to introduce our two presenters, um, Dr. Ivan Escott, he's the CEO and director, and David Burkitt, the uh, CGO, the uh, Chief Growth Officer, um, and director also. Um, so the synopsis um, they gave to us was composite AI and models for modernizing government services. So over that, I'll turn my camera off and it's over to you guys. Lovely. Thank you very much, Matt. Uh, appreciate everyone uh, taking the time to attend this morning. Um, what we're going to try and do is um, introduce uh, the, con the concept of composite AI and uh, a few of its different users um, and discuss how we're applying it with our philosophy um, and then we're also going to show you how we're doing that in some QGov projects at the moment. Um, but to kind of frame uh, where we're at as an organisation, um, so we've got 45 team members. Uh, last year we were recognised by Bio Queensland for as a finalist of putting Queenslanders first um, through our local engagement of local team members, as well as our First Nations scholarship with UQ. Um, and in the last 12 months, we've also been ISO 27001 certified um, and uh, started doing our annual EcoBiz Eco sustainability assessment, uh, moving towards becoming carbon neutral um, and getting 2032 ready. Um, and uh, we've been a 13.3B panel member um, for the last two years and have done a few engagements. And the one that we're showcasing today will, was actually engaged by 13.3B. Um, and we're at the bottom of 13.3B as W, so you just yeah, go W was the not good. <laughs> <laughs> um, but that's, that's us. And um, I'll hand over to Evan to introduce uh, Composite AI and a few of its uses. Awesome. Thanks, Dave. Um, all right. Um, so um, just going to introduce Composite AI first. Um, so AI, as we know, has got uh, all the buzz at the moment, uh, especially with the uh, release of some of the big systems like uh, ChatGVT. Um, so what is composite AI? Um, so AI is um, a very umbrella term uh, and there are a lot of different parts to AI um, above sort of those um, large language models, um, lots of different areas for them. Um, some of the areas are search and optimization. Um, of course, you've got your machine learning, uh, neural networks, intelligent agents, um, uh, you name it, there's all sorts of different things in AI. So Composite AI is about recognising that you've got all these different algorithms and tools uh, at your disposal, but it, the question is how do you actually use those effectively uh, to um, achieve your business goals? Now, how we've found um, to do this is to use in the use of pipelines. Um, so those people familiar with DevOps, and I'll talk a little bit more about DevOps later on in the presentation. Uh, if you have a pipeline, which is a repeatable sort of process that you can do, it's how you actually use the composite AI uh, across these pipelines to get a, a repeatable result. Um, now, above, um, uh, not above, sorry, um, talking about um, ChatGPT in these large language models, uh, in fact, anything that has got machine learning um, that underpins it will have an error rate. Uh, it's just the way that the uh, algorithm works. Um, and so you're going to have some sort of level of inaccuracy. 
Um, what we've found is um, and important to us, and it's the big sticker on the left hand side there, uh, is that you have to hit the edit button on any of these things, trusting that the uh, the machine learning and the chat GPT is going to produce what you want. Uh, it doesn't. It might give you a first review. It might give you a, a little bit of a framework help with analysis, uh, but it's not really giving us the 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 final polished product at this point. Um, so what that means is we need to actually uh, balance uh, the use of AI uh, with the use of humans and how we actually get that balance. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about shortly. Um, so that's a bit of an introduction about composite AI. So just think of it as opening it up to the entire suite of what AI is about, not just machine learning algorithms and how you actually use those to solve business problems across our uh, pipelines. Okay, so probably, probably more, what do you drink? And, and can you... Sorry to interrupt, I can hear people talking. Can they please put their mics on? Turn them off, please, thank you. Uh, no worries, I thought that was a question. Thanks, Matt. <laughs> All right, cool. Uh, all right, uh, next slide, please, Jess. All right, so um, how do we actually use AI when we're modernizing legacy systems? So we specialize in modernizing legacy systems. Um, one you would have heard of to take a look at is, um, is using AI around coding. Uh, and the big famous one at the moment is Copilot. Again, with Copilot, what we've found is that um, it does produce code, uh, doesn't always compile, uh, but it also always needs to, to go through the usual review processes. Um, people need to edit. So it's almost like a fancy autocomplete, uh, which gets you a, to where you want to get to a little bit quicker, uh, but you still need to go ahead and uh, finish off things. Uh, so it's about using that AI and the best tools uh, for the teams. Um, we, we found that optimization problems are very common uh, in uh, modernizing legacy systems. Uh, we come across optimization, search, uh, scheduling, if you like, those types of problems. Uh, so AI is really good in those areas. Um, but what we've actually found is that um, there's a whole nother set of technologies um, which you may not have heard about yet, uh, which is starting to get some serious airtime, uh, which um, gives um, a lot of power for teams to produce high quality software at scale. Uh, and that's the area called platform engineering. Um, so if you haven't, haven't read about it yet, um, take a look into this area. Um, they talk in platform engineering, what they talk about is uh, golden paths. So a golden path, if you like, if you imagine uh, no matter where you are within the business, you want to do something or you want to lead someone down a golden path so they produce the same result each time. Uh, so platform engineering for us is about how do we use models to represent these golden paths and then use those within modernization projects. Um, which which works really, really nicely. Uh, but again, what we're um, experiencing is that it's that balance between both the AI technologies uh, and the humans, the development team, so empowering those teams. Um, and what's really important, again, another tip here, if you haven't um, come across this yet, have a look at an area called team topologies. So team topologies is about how you actually get a really nice mix and the right way that the teams all work together and communicate um, a, a very a very nice area and it touches on platform engineering uh, thank you for the thumbs up inside there yeah team topologies is really nice so getting that balance again um, but getting that shared understanding across those teams across the organization and the use within those ai technologies the use of models uh, is super important um, and everything to us is a model. So you can model a user interface, you can model a database, you can model a business process, um, but it's about creating that shared understanding and then using those models in the software engineering process. Um, we can really scale our, our modernization projects. Um, so how we actually do that um, is we use a technique uh, called Jadoka. Um, now, Jadoka uh, comes out of um, lean manufacturing. Um, so we've all heard of Kanban systems. 
Uh, again, Kanban systems came out of lean manufacturing. Jadoka is another concept out of lean manufacturing that we use, uh, and it's a Japanese word, and it uh, loosely translates loosely uh, to automation with a human touch. Uh, so in lean manufacturing, uh, what they um, wanted to do was to make sure that their engineers could 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 make the components of the, the manufacturing line to the standards and the quality that they actually want. So they're actually using the human skills. And then once they've worked out how to do that, then how do they apply automation to automate that process so they can actually scale their manufacturing? So again, getting that balance between uh, the machine, if you like, uh, and the human. So Jadoka uh, for us is a big part of it. Now, our interpretation of Jadoka um, is there's two things that we bring in, my two loves of our software. Uh, so the first one is DevOps. Uh, so hopefully you've heard of DevOps. Um, you would have heard a lot of different things. I break DevOps down into a pretty basic concept I find um, uh, resonates with people. Uh, so DevOps is about using pipelines to break down the walls between development and operations. So traditionally, you've got your development team over here and your operations team over here, and you've got this big wall between them, and, and there's all this sort of going backwards and forwards and long release cycles and all those horrible things that go along with that. So the big part of DevOps is having a pipeline that underpins those two. So you have this smooth process that allows people to go from development through to operations. Um, so it breaks down that wall. Um, now, on top of that, what we use is model-driven engineering or using models. And in a similar way, you've got these disconnected systems within the actual uh, organization. And once you model those, you can build bridges uh, between those systems and create all sorts of efficiencies between that. Um, so that is what br helps bring Jadoka to life. Definitely. <clears throat> all right. So... Thanks, that, Evan. Uh, what we want to do is talk a bit about one of the projects we've done recently uh, that encompasses that philosophy um, and then go through and show you guys how we've actually achieved that. Uh, so this is the IEMR configuration portal. So this is the basically change portal that sits on top of the IEMR project for eHealth. Uh, previously, it was a monolithic uh, legacy application and the team was constrained in that they couldn't make any changes to it uh, because they were, it was a, their business logic was basically too tightly coupled uh, to the application. Uh, so we did a like for like replacement um, and modernized it. And as you can see, it's uh, to the new Queensland government design standards. Uh, so we'll go through and show you how that links up from the various models and DevOps to deliver the actual application. Right, so this is a little video recorded earlier. This is um, a platform engineering tool called Cobots that's built by our sister company uh, that we use on all of our projects. Um, so the first thing that it's showing here uh, is uh, the concept of a meta model. Uh, so the meta model is a beautiful concept because it allows us to model anything within the actual application itself. Um, like I was saying before, you can uh, model processes, you can model databases, APIs, it doesn't matter, everything is a model. Um, so the example model that um, was built for um, health is this one here. So this is an example of a UI model. So you can build out all your low fidelity models, all the configuration, you name it, you can put it into the actual uh, model. Um, once it's all modeled up, them using pipelines, again, the, the running theme. Uh, here's an example of a pipeline. You can run these models through the pipelines, uh, and then that will then produce a lot of artifacts. In fact, for this case, a full stack um, software application that you um, saw before. Um, so this is the pipeline running. Um, you can run this either on the platform or locally uh, as, a, as a developer, which is a really nice workflow. Uh, and the um, technology that comes out in this case was um, uh, compliant um, code, C-sharp code, um, with a React front end. And Chakra component and, and Chakra components. Uh, and here's a fully readable uh, source code, uh, which is which is lovely. I think this this particular um, project um, ended up with over 95% of the application 
uh, generated or produced through a pipeline and the models. Uh, and then there's a little bit extra that developers need to add in uh, at the end. Now, the way they add that in at the end is, um, keep going there, just, yep, is these protected regions. Very easy to do just between some code comments and you can add these protected regions in. Um, now, all of the source code produced uh, goes into a Git repository, all the pipelines and quality and everything uh, is extremely high. So a very good result here and a happy customer. Yeah, and it was um, also web content accessibility guidelines were all met. Uh, on top of that as well, um, we focused using Judoka on taking a breadth first approach. Um, so we only had a limited amount of time under the contract um, where we wouldn't have enough to deliver it. Um, so we actually empowered uh, the DHS team to actually carry on delivering it. So we focused on building all of the components um, and Millard and the team are now, and James are actually going through and delivering the rest of that uh, right now, which is fantastic. Um, so we kind of empowered them to use the models um, and then customize it down into the source. Um, and then it's their application and they can deploy it how they like. All right, here's some examples of uh, some other projects we, we've done and are doing. Um, so at the moment, uh, we're modernizing uh, three uh, disparate legacy systems for TMR for the management of their property systems into one new like-for-like -like system. Uh, we've previously uh, taken seven different databases for the fatal crash management for Police New South Wales and put that into a single application. Um, and we've done a POC for TMR for their QRide system. So uh, any spreadsheet based systems where things are constrained by that manual spreadsheet, we can modernize that um, into a web application. Um, and talking about disparate systems, uh, we've been engaged by the Department of Defense for the last six years uh, to modernize their procurement platform uh, for CASG. So uh, that won an innovation award um, and uh, has now moved on from material, non material to material procurement and is being mandated by the Department of Defense for procurement, uh, which is a fantastic story. So they've gone from using manila folders and spreadsheets and access databases to having a real time web application that's delivering them real time insights on what the Department of Defense is actually spending. So there's a few different use cases and examples um, of how we can modernize there. Um, and go for Jess. Um, happy to open up to Q&A uh, before we do so as well. Um, that QR code there is a link to our link tree. Um, on there, you can follow us on social media or you can sign up to our monthly modernization insights newsletter. Uh, if you sign up at the moment, uh, we're linking that to our sustainability policy um, and we'll plant a tree for everyone who signs up. Nice. Which is cool. Um, so feel free to go for Q&A.